We've got another great interview for you guys. Tom Shadiak is a writer, director, and producer. Yeah, you might know a couple of movies he's written and directed, like Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, and Nutty Professor. He's also directed Liar Liar, Patch Adams, Bruce Almighty, and Evan Almighty. Um, I think some Americans might have seen your movies. I, yes, I believe they a few have. Yes, <laughs> I thank right. you and I owe them very much. Um, and uh, you also uh, did the documentary I Am, which I saw recently, which is amazing, and I want to talk to you about thank you, a thank little you. bit yeah. more later. Yeah, a little bit of a turn, but yeah. Yeah, thanks. no question about that. Yeah. We'll talk about why you turned, too. So, um, but I want to start at the beginning, as always. Uh, yes. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Northern Virginia, right outside of the Washington, D.C. area. Moved out here, went to the University of Virginia, government major, went right into joke writing. Can you imagine studying government? going into joke writing. Well, that kind of uh, makes sense in some Kind ways. of makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, um, joke writing is all about absurdity, and there were many absurdities I found. I used to be a Senate page. Oh, really? Uh, I was a Senate page, Did, yes. It, you know, uh, was, I don't know the Senate page program. Is yeah. it for a specific senator, or is it for the Senate overall? You have to be uh, sponsored by a senator. It was Senator James Aburisk from South Dakota. I don't know if you remember him, but many, many years ago. Um, very popular with the Indian causes, and a wonderful guy. He sponsored me. Then you get in and you see how it works or doesn't work. Okay, did yeah. any of the senators hit on you? Uh, that's be look, I was an altar boy and a Senate page. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the fifth <laughs> on this one. So boy, I mean, if you survive that. <laughs> the show okay. just got dark very right. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why the jump or you know, how the jump? Uh, how do you go from caring about politics and government to comedy writing? Well, or, or not caring so much. Seeing the absurdity of it is what I always saw. You know, that's where I think humor comes from. When I watch The Daily Show, I see that they see the absurdity of what we do, how we behave. And I always found it a bit absurd. I, I, you know, I even listened to the news tonight, and it sounds like a bunch of kids, you know? So that's where the humor comes from. And I didn't want to see myself in the serious side of it, so I, I kind of took the other way. You know, one more thing before we get to your Hollywood career, you were in the who's who of American high school students. Holy goodness, I, I didn't realize that. My gosh, why am I here? I, uh, <laughs> so where's what, Oprah? Uh, so that's, that's kind of amazing. How, why, what happened? What'd you do when you were in high school? I, I, I have no idea. Apparently I, I bribed the right guidance counselor. Um, oh really, I you don't know? Usual, I did the usual things, you know? I, I was in Key Club or, 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 you know, that's where my joke writing started. I started writing jokes with a, with a fellow. We did a joke of the day. We. We did service projects. I did well in high school. I don't know, you know. Okay, I right. you, somebody. and you went to UVA. You went to UCLA Film School. So I assume your grade point average was like 8.0. Oh, or and something. I discovered the internet. I forgot. Oh, did right. I, uh, that must. Have I been forgot good. that okay. one. Okay, all right. No. Uh, so now, uh, obviously, Ace Ventura is an enormous hit. How did that come about? Yeah, well it came about, I was an overnight success after 11 years of trying to find my way of in course. show business. So I did a little bit of everything, that joke writing I told you about, wrote some sitcoms, films, etc. Sold a couple things, but didn't really know what I wanted to do. Went back to film school and then boom, I knew I was going to be a director. Soon enough, uh, the script, which had been around for about 10 years, comes along. It's Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Oh, really? But it wasn't what you see today. It wasn't the story that you see where the he's a she and all that stuff. Right. And uh, I met on it. I got this crazy idea uh, with a friend of mine, Eugene Leibowitz, and we, we rewrote it and hired this guy who was an unknown at the time. He was the white guy on In Living Color, mm -hmm. Jim Carrey. And a lot of people thought we were crazy because he'd done four or five films before and he hadn't quite busted out. And, and you know, it became what it was. And Jim just skyrocketed. So did you audition a bunch of people and then you saw Jim Carrey and thought, that's it? Jim or? was it. I'd seen him in the comedy clubs. I was a student of comedy. I'd been to the comedy clubs. Jim just took over comedy club. He was just, he was the light. And if you remember in Living Color, he was stealing every skit, skit he was in. Absolutely. So the yeah. idea was if we could tap into this guy, it would be nuclear. You would find something, an energy source that would be unmatched. And I think we did a decent job as doing that. When Ace Ventura broke out, was it totally organic or was there some like marketing thing, etc., that wound up, or just people saw it and they were like, damn, that's funny. And that's it. It's just, it makes you laugh. In fact, when we were doing it, the studio thought it was like going to be a huge bomb and that we were going to go straight to video. Um, nobody knew what we had. Jim and I just knew we were laughing a lot. We picked a tone that was obviously over the top. It was a cartoon come to life. And it was just basically really funny. It was kind of like an ode to joy. And, and people responded. After that, you get a lot more popular in Hollywood? Like instantly, like crazy, like stereotypical crazy, like the big picture, if you've ever seen that movie. Uh -huh. The phone doesn't ring for 11 years. Suddenly, it's Spielberg, Katzenberg, you know, et cetera. 
uh, studio heads, and that's it's, awesome. And it's a literally eleven year overnight, you know, crazy. And did they so, pretend that they were always on your side? No, no, there was no pretending. It was, okay. you know, you know, look, it, they, the show business is hungry for for new new voices, and so they, you know, instantly felt they had a new voice and wanted, you know, to open the door. So then they say, okay, here's gobs of money, go make liar, liar, nutty professor, etc. I'm going back to the gobs of money part. Um, they basically <laughs> say, yeah, here's a lot more money, and w what do you want to do now? That's basically what they say. What do you want to do now? And they have a bunch of scripts that are not that good, uh -huh. and then you have to see if you have a way to make them better. Right, and you read through all those to try to find the best. Probably read 100 scripts. Wow. And then I ended up doing The Nutty Professor because I thought Eddie Murphy at the time, I grew up with Eddie Murphy, he's, he's a genius, and I thought nobody's tapped into that genius in about 10 years, and I wanted to try that. So that was again really smart uh, on those two fronts. So after you know, so you're saying that all the studios come. That's totally understandable. How about the other people, like the actors, whatever that is, that are all around Hollywood? Do they wind up kissing your ass a lot more? Um, no, I'm keeping it real. Yeah, you know? no, no, I understand. Um, I, I, I wouldn't quite frame it as kissing my ass. I do have to work with these people. <laughs> yeah, they're all ass kissers. <laughs> to hell with them. Um, no, uh, uh, look, they, they, they felt that I had a certain gift to give them a stage. And so a lot of people who were in comedy were expressing an interest in working with me. So, okay, that's, I yeah. love the way you put that. Listen, you sure man, you're not going back listen, into man, politics? I, I, yeah, I might be an agent after this, so. <laughs> All right, so, so that's great. And then uh, now let's turn to the topic that I love, the, the movie that you made I Am. Yeah, well we're going to relate these things. We're going right. to, we've laid out my Hollywood, the rise, and now right. we're going to talk about right. something else. Exactly. So this is what I, I'm, I'm, I'm. So let's talk about the turn. Tell yeah. me about what happened with the accident and, and what that led to. All right, well, first of all, uh, in that rise, I'm glad we set that up, there was a toxin that I became aware of as I was rising, suddenly to the victor belongs the spoils, as right. you know, there's a toxin there, and I felt it. So here I am, this guy that you just laid out, you know, uh, I was raised in a, in a basically Judeo-Christian atmosphere where I'm taught that, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you're not to store up treasures on earth, etc. and uh, the spiritual life, you know, uh, isn't one of addition, but one of subtraction, all those things, and yet, I'm now adding, I'm, I'm, I'm accumulating. Didn't quite feel right. It didn't lead to higher levels of happiness. It wasn't what the quote American dream promised. So all that is sort of the undercurrent and I started changing my life long before the, the bike accident. I had moved into a mobile home by then. I left the mansion lifestyle, moved into a mobile home, gave away oh, I, lots of I my got resources. I the impression that it was after the accident. No, it happened before. You had that recognition. I had that, I, yes. I definitely was changing my life for 10 years at least before the accident. The accident made me talk about it. I got in a bike accident, for those who don't know. I nearly died, I had a concussion, turned into post-concussion syndrome, a brutal condition. Some people commit suicide on it, athletes struggle with this. It's really very, very challenging. And I didn't think I was gonna make it. And so I simply said, if this is the last act, if this is it, this is my last chapter, what do I wanna say? I'm a filmmaker, do I wanna say anything? And I decided to make a movie about what I had discovered and to talk to people uh, to see if the principles I had discovered meant anything at all. So I talked to some of the leaders uh, you know, in different disciplines and said, you know, let's have a conversation about what's really going on in the world, uh, what I'm participating in, some of the ills, and how do we get out of this mess that we're in? Uh, obviously, I'm very curious about that. But one last thing about the concussion then. Uh, Post-concussion syndrome, we just did a story on the Young Turks about Junior Seau and how he committed yeah, suicide, yeah, yeah, and obviously yeah. he had similar issues. Yeah. What happens that, that people get so, it becomes such a dark place and they think like suicide is the only way out? What do you experience? What do you go through? Well, you know, it's, it's different for different people, but it, it's basically like a computer that no longer functions. Your brain essentially being a computer that takes in stimuli and knows what to do with it. It no longer knows what to do with it. So these lights would be very painful. Any sound would, would be like a kind of torture, like a, a, a high-pitched sound that for you, it was just a clanking plate. For me, it was, it was death. Uh -huh. So it, it, it's a very isolating disease. You find people have to check into hotel rooms. They have to leave their families. They're right. socialized behind. They have to basically shut the computer down. And n nothing helps but time. And it's, the brain is very slow in healing in most cases. It can heal, but it takes a lot of time. So you just feel alone and you don't have human interaction. I didn't, I didn't even use a cell phone for three years, which actually turned wow. out to be a plus. Um, but, but it's a very isolating, debilitating disease. And because it's painful, some people have severe headaches, I just 
felt like the emergency broadcast system was in my head 24 hours a day. If I put that in your head, for a minute, it would be painful. If I said, now it's never gonna go away, you would be, you can become despondent. So, um, yeah, because that's what people don't understand. Like, they look at Junior Seau, for, as an example, incredible football player, very wealthy, right. has all the things, you know, gorgeous house, yada, yada, as, as you know. And then they think, and you're right, so often in those football players' cases, you see them check into a hotel first. Yeah, that's you know, right. because and I didn't know until you just yeah. told me they're trying to get away from the world. Yeah. And if my head was constantly in pain for three straight years, I there isn't much to live for. I get it, but thank God you made it out somehow. Yeah, yeah. And, and so now you're okay, obviously. Yeah. And, and you make the movie, and. The main question I, I want to ask you is, what did you discover? You asked mm. all these incredibly smart people yeah. about life, what's the essence of life, what did you find out? Well, you know, we have these theories, and I believed in these theories in my heart, in that intuitive place that we're all brothers and sisters, that everything's connected, all those things. But what I didn't know is there was a ton of, excuse me, scientific evidence to back that up. From the field of quantum physics to uh, uh, of cellular biology, uh, to what they're discovering now in positive psychology, there is a ton of scientific evidence to prove that what our saints and sages and mystics have intuited all along is actually the meat and marrow of reality. So it put flesh on the bones for me. I knew the bones about love thy neighbor, even love thy enemy, et cetera, right? But those were kind of ideas. This really made it walk in the world. Yeah, I struggle with love thy enemy. Can't wait. <laughs> I, I usually you try do. to kick my enemy's ass. You do? Yeah, that's, yeah I've I got a be movie for it's you, a uh, me. Uh, Gandhi. I'm going to give it to you. I just saw it again. Uh, yeah, well, look, there, there's a couple paths we can take. We can go and kick our enemy's ass. And then what we find, again, through history and the way reality works, is that creates an energy in, quote, our enemy and other people in the world that bounces back, mm -hmm. right? So the reason I think the saints and sages said, love your enemy, is you're putting out an energy that doesn't invite back a counter force. And so that's like science. Like, if I say F you, you're gonna say F you, and I'm gonna say F you, you wanna take it outside and it's gonna escalate. Right, but, but I'm if, gonna win, it's gonna be awesome. We know that, we know this is your show, you're gonna win. When I have you on my show, I'll win. No, um, but if you say to me, F you, Tom, and I say, you know what, it's cool, I, I understand, it's been a rough day. All of a sudden you have nothing to bounce back and you watch it dissipate. That on a micro scale is, I believe, what Gandhi did, Martin Luther King did on a macro scale. So let's talk about the energy, because you know I, I'm an agnostic, uh, you know, and I've gotten a couple of awards for being Agnostic Congratulations. Media, right, you know, thank you. Yes, okay. yes, yes. I really don't now, believe it. Agnostic <laughs> simply okay. means, because there's many definitions, right. but simply means that you're, you're like, you're open, you don't have yeah. sort of have, yeah. Right. right. So now, uh, but when you talk about energy, I think a lot of people start to say, whoa, that sounds new age and hippie mm -hmm. and all that stuff, and he's already got long hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tell, tell me what you mean by energy. Uh, I mean science. I mean mm -hmm. everything is energy. What do you think is coming out of my mouth? It's energy. It's waves that your ears are picking up. I mean mm -hmm. energy. It's mm -hmm. all energy. So we are literally sitting in energy. There's energy all around us. Again, talking about quantum physics. It's energy. So every act actually has an energy. So I'm not talking about anything new age or hippie or whatever. I'm talking about reality. I'm not mm -hmm. actually interested in utopia. When I say love your enemy, I'm not interested in utopia. I'm mm -hmm. interested in a way that I think actually will help us survive as a species. And as long as we keep trying to blow each other up and we can outdo each other, one day we're gonna to get to a point where there's no return. Mm -hmm. And there was something in the movie about, is it Argon? Yes, Argon. So tell me, t tell me about that. Argon is, a, is, a, is an analogous story of how we're all connected. It essential, Argon is an element that you breathe in and it's inert. So when you breathe in oxygen, it comes out, it changes and it comes out carbon. Mm -hmm. So when you breathe in Argon, it comes out Argon. So they can actually calculate uh, the number of argon atoms, because you, you breathe it in and then it goes out and it wafts around the room and yours wafts around the room. It's a little creepy. Yeah. Um, and, but we know how many argon atoms we can calculate that were once in the lungs of dinosaurs that you are now breathing in, that were once in the lungs of Jesus Christ, of Joan of Arc, of Caesar. We all share this thing called argon. So it's just a story basically of, of chemical connection uh, between all living things. Okay, but it's an analogy more than else. I mean, it's literal. It's literal. It's literal. Yeah. But it doesn't mean like it, it, that. It connects us in some way, but it's it's not like uh, Shirley MacLaine. I'm actually Caesar. 
No, 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 no. Right. Again, look, there's much more connective stories. That's a nice story because, again, it shows you even at the analogous level there's connections. But, I mean, we already know through the human genome study that person that we call our enemy is already a family member. We know that we all come from the same two parents in sub-Saharan Africa. That's the human genome study. So when these guys come along and say, you know what, we're all brothers and sisters, the poets like Walt Whitman, et cetera, say, we're all brothers and sisters. We actually are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see us as a big family. And like, I think that when we get to a place where we actually do love each other as family, we're still gonna argue, we're gonna fight, there's gonna be the crazy one, the lazy one, the one we have to take care of, the one we ha who we have to feed, but we're not going to let them starve. Go ahead, come on, come at no, me, no, I can see it. No, 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 I'm no. losing I wanna, you. No, no, you're not. I, I wanna dive into it just a little bit more, right? Please, let's go. Because I'm having trouble wrapping my mind around energy. So, for example, yeah. I, I love Ralph Waldo Emerson. You quote him a couple times in the movie. Uh, and uh, I love Taoism. And, and mm -hmm. what connects those two things mm -hmm. is the same idea that we're actually all one. Because I think that there's something intuitive and something logical about that, right? Mm -hmm. And you stress science, et cetera, in the movie, right? But what is it? Like, so what is it that connects us uh, It's altogether? called the field. Okay. It's called the field. There's actually no end to you. I'm actually not even touching you. These are two energy fields that are bouncing off, two electromagnetic fields that are bouncing off each other. That's why right. Buckminster Fuller said his last words were nothing touches. Everything is connected to an energy field. Do you know what quantum physics is? Again, mm -hmm. I don't want to do it crazy on the show. Uh -huh. Quantum physics has told us that there's a theory called entanglement theory, spooky action at a distance. So you take two particles that have ever been in relation, you know, rotating around a nuclei. They, they separate them an infinite distance. If you affect one at the exact same time, all the way across the universe, the other one is affected simultaneously. How is that possible? There has to be an allowance for time for that effect to travel to get to that effect. The field is what the theory is what connects everything. Einstein said the field is the only reality. So there's no end to me, there's no beginning to you, there's no end to this coffee cup. If you look at the molecular level, it's all dots, and space is not empty, it's all connected. Hence the butterfly effect, right? You, 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 you do something to here, and then the weather's affected in Brazil. These things are science because everything is connected through some kind of field. So, it, Wow. I, I think, no, no, I, I get it. And I think that a lot of atheists, their heads are exploding now. No, 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 it's all rock, it's all rock, right? Now, but it's not because there's science behind it, as you say, like the random uh, number generator. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, yeah. trippy, you know? And, yeah. and, and so I'm fascinated by this. So for people who don't know, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I just want to jump on this uh, atheist real quick, if you don't mind, because sure. to me, it's simply, it's simply semantics. I use the word God. I'm not afraid to use the word God, but I don't believe in the guy with a beard. And, God to me is another word for mystery, source, like how did it all start? What's making me speak? What is that thing, right? Mm -hmm. I call it, just call it mystery, mm -hmm. right? An atheist might believe in love, kindness, community, like doing the best they can, promoting a good, it's the same thing to me, right? You mm -hmm. call it love, I call it source, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't see this great divide other than the dogma of religions, which I think is going to eventually go away. Yeah, so. uh, we're all against the dogma of the religions, all yeah. the reasonable people yeah. in the world, like we get that part. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, but. Um, dogma, by the way, is God spelled backwards twice. Dog is God spelled backwards. Ma is am, the original utterance of God is I am in the traditions, so it's God spelled backwards twice. So I think it's upside down when we have, when we say dogma. <laughs> That's all interesting. Right. So all the right. random More number More atheists generator. changing the channel. Okay, Okay. <laughs> More uh, random <laughs> number generator. Yeah, wow, random number generator. So, mm. what, like, here's the thing, like, so for people who don't know, there's a random number generator yep. and, it, and it measures something, that's the thing I don't understand what it measures. And during 9-11, it just spikes like crazy because everybody's having a similar emotion at the same time. But what is spiking? Okay, okay, so, all right, let me, let me see if I can explain this. And I'm gonna give you a layman's uh, a view of this because I am a layman, but I, I do think I understand the base, basics of it. A random number generator spits out random numbers. So picture flipping a coin, just random, it's random, right? It's either gonna come up ones or zeros at random. Right. At certain times when the human collective energy, now that we have the internet and these technologies, now that we can collectively have an experience and send out a lot of, quote, energy, the gasp, they first measured it when O.J. Simpson trial happened and some people were celebrating around the, uh, around the country and the world and other people were gasping in horror, but a big emotional reaction. Suddenly those random number generators, which are spitting out numbers randomly, suddenly they, they, they're no longer random. They start showing an order that didn't exist before. So 9-11 happens, big energy shift throughout the world, right? 
people in, 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 in shock and horror, big, so those, suddenly those random number generators, zero, one, zero, one, suddenly one, 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 they go in order. Something is shifting the energy that is turning these random number generators into no longer random. What is a random number? Is it a computer? And how in the world does it, the energy affect the computer? You've got to have another uh, guest on to explain <laughs> that. Uh, well, I can tell you though, so, the energy obviously is somehow doing something to affect this, this device, which again is using energy to right. spit out these no, numbers. And, and it's real. And it affects the Earth's field as well. The Earth's field is a measurable field, uh -huh. and you can see that these they're having uh, a, a, a shift in the Earth's field at these times. And what, here's what's really weird. There's evidence to show that, it, that it's, it's, it's pre-event, that, that's, I don't know if it's seconds or minutes before, you start to see the shift and then the event happens, as if space and time are actually illusions. And so when you have that heart intuition, that there's something that's ahead of the event. Tom, you know, from time to time throughout this discussion, it, you, you get the sense that I'm, you know, being skeptical or something. I'm inquiring because actually, secretly, you have no idea how much I agree with you. Mm, mm, and, mm. It's, uh, and I've had these debates with my atheist friends, and I know the terms are goofy, atheist, agnostic, whatever, yeah. right? But um, it is in science. It's just yeah. we're, at the, we're a baby. The humankind has only been around for how many? 30,000 years we have the, the drawings in the caves, right? So yeah. It's only been 30,000 years since we made our first drawing. That's We're right. a tiny little infant. Exactly. So we haven't figured out all of uh, science. And time and space are the trippiest things in the world. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And you think we've got time and space figured out? Of course we don't. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there's so much more we're going to learn about that. And I think people who close that off and say, no, 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 because they're so worried because religion has dominated us for so long. So that if everybody's, I think what the atheists are worried about is like if you open that door, you know, religion is going to pour in with their dogma and their nonsense yeah, and their yeah. mythology. Yeah. So I get the concern, but we really got to study this stuff a lot more because it's fascinating yeah, look, and it, it goes to our core. It's understandable that there is this hot button about religion, but there are many people that get left out of the conversation, which are the reasonable people who say, I don't really have the answer. I have a very strong sense that there's something there. I see creativity at the beginning of every act. Why wouldn't it be at the beginning of whatever this time model is, right? right. So that's, that's a reasonable idea about, quote, faith. And a lot of times these discussions get railroaded into the extremes, right? right. Your religion has all the answers, is better than that religion. That's, that's nothing, that's like politics, you know? Like it's two kids fighting and that's not where, where we're gonna right. find any, any growth. And I, you know, you talked about what you call it. I call it order. You know, it's mm. funny that you I use that I love that. Word. Yeah. Organizing intelligence yeah. is another name for whatever is happening. I, I yeah. don't know what makes up that order. Yeah. I don't know what the essence yeah. of that order is at all, but yeah. there is order in the universe. E equals MC squared. It yeah. doesn't all equal it's MC cubed everywhere. tomorrow or yesterday. It's everywhere. Right. You're yeah. absolutely right. What happens in nature, if we go away, all of a sudden nature starts organizing everything that we left behind into some, it'll use everything we've left behind and it'll organize it. Yeah, yeah. And, and so there's chaos and there's order. Yeah. Both of those things exist. To say that chaos doesn't exist is crazy. To say that order doesn't exist is crazy. It's counterfactual, right? It doesn't mean order has a beard. It's not a sky god. Right, okay. right, 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 right. But these are young ideas, like you said. They're young ideas. We're young. So right. we have young ideas, and we basically have cave paintings, if you will, of the organizing intelligence. Right. You know? So now let's talk about how you apply that in your life. So you go through these epiphanies. You, in the movie, you talk to these incredibly smart people from all these different fields. After having gone through this and you get rid of your big houses and your excess and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and are you happier now? Uh, yes, absolutely. No question. And happiness is just a measure of a system working well. And I think we're designed to work in concert with other people, uh, in community, uh, in service, to feel a part of something greater than ourselves. And so I'm doing those things. And so consequently, yeah, I'm much, much happier. Do you ever miss the old homes? Uh, no, truthfully, no. In fact, I go in, I went into my home recently, I, I had to do a little more filming uh, my old home, and it feels lonely to me. It feels very lonely. Like, I, I don't know how I, I lived in, you know, there were three homes in this one Pasadena state, 17,000 square feet in total, but the one main home was around nine or 10,000 square feet, and it just seems empty to me. You know, there's a reason that parties always end up in the kitchen. 
You know, like we end up in small spaces because that's basically who we are. We're like we're cave people. You know, we like we like to huddle and around. You we're know. communal, right? We're communal. We huddle around. We huddle together. We like to be in in groups. So that's the the one part that you and I might disagree on because. I get what you're saying. Happiness is not about wealth. Now, now mm -hmm. it's easy for people who have money to say that, and I think a guy who's struggling to pay his bills says, "Oh, screw you! I, I got to get this money, otherwise I can't feed my family." It's about money. So we all get that there's a minimum, right? Like you got to hit that minimum, and that minimum might be fairly high. By the and way, the it, research backs exa exactly what you're saying. Happiness is uh, levels are changed significantly uh, when you're trying to make basic uh, uh, needs, when you're trying to meet your basic needs. So right. if you if you need a meal and you don't have a meal. If you get a meal, it's gonna make you a lot happier. So that's absolutely right. Right. Yeah. Now, here's where I, d I diverge. Come I on, baby. I, I like the big house. I mean, am yeah, I a yeah, bad yeah. guy? I, no. I love a house with a view, no. right? I love looking at yeah. the ocean. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I pay a little extra now that I can when yeah. I go to a hotel. In the old days, I'd still I'd go by yeah. the water in Miami, where I love to go, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'd stay in the worst rundown hotel you'd be embarrassed to go into, yeah. but just so that it, it would have a view, right? Yeah. And now I can afford just a little better, right? And so is that, is that wrong? Is Absolutely it, not. Right. That's your note. You have to be true to your note. So my note was not a mansion, mm -hmm. but your note very well may be, I like a little space, I like a little bit of this or that. It doesn't do anything for me anymore. I've had it, I've tested it, it doesn't do anything for me. I prefer myself to move into more communal spaces, more reasonable spaces, more simple spaces, and then I have more energy to, to devote to things that really move my heart. But it's absolute, look, just like nature, the human species is going to uh, be strengthened by diversity. So I don't want everybody having the same house. I don't want everybody in the same amount of square feet. Right. I think you need to ask yourself, what's true for me? Mm -hmm. And if it's true for you, you may use that house for uh, uh, meetings to further the human conversation, to bring community art into your home. There's no judgment about that at all. There are principles that underlie these things that I think are universal in your experience and mine. And the principle is what is true for you and are you serving with what you have something greater than yourself? It may be serving your own rest. Right. And that's good. So, you know, I see a lot of guys who are into Zen and, you know, I'm Turkish, so I, I know people that are into Rumi as, you know, as one guy. Love in the Rumi. Movie. Right. So, yeah. uh, but then if you poke them a little bit, they lose it. And <laughs> so, like, poke me. <laughs> right. Like, I, 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 look, I'll be honest. My cousin, he's all into like meditation and, yeah. mm, and he's a lot. Yeah, sure. And then if you like go to him a little bit, he loses it. They flip you off. Right. <laughs> okay. Of course. So, <laughs> that's why he's into meditation, because, yeah. <laughs> Because right. he's trying to quell that anger, yeah. So for you, let's assume you don't do that. Tell me if you do. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. Like you get, first of all, let me ask you that. Like go to a Starbucks, something goes wrong. Do you get mad? Do you yell at people anymore? Or are you like super zen? Well, I don't go to Starbucks, so that's the first <laughs> thing. Um, but um, I, would, I would hope to be zen. But do I still have anger in me? Of course. I'm, I'm human. And, and uh, uh, I still have to deal with those, those uh, voices that divide. But it's not where I where I want to be. I find much more energy when uh, I stay in the middle. And and uh, so I, I so you know if you all right so let's good you don't get angry. Come on, God bless. Come on, okay. piss me off. Come on. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, not going to poke you. <laughs> okay. Besides which, I wouldn't actually be touching you. There's a whole energy field. The energy fields are touching. Okay. You see what I'm, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, but how do you find that? Did he that? just hit on me? Does anybody know? <laughs> I feel like I, that was a hit. Uh, okay, all right, never mind. I, I, I agree with you in a lot of things, but probably not in that direction. Okay, sorry. Okay. So um, how do you stay happy? So it, it's kind of an interesting question, but yeah. like, don't you, do you have to remind yourself all the time? Well, I tell you, the uh, Declaration of Independence got this one wrong, and that is happiness is not a pursuit, it's a practice. So how do you stay happy? You do the things that make you happy. So I've never pursued happiness for happiness's sake. Mm -hmm. I have done things which I have felt are good and right and true for me, and happiness has been the result. So I didn't move into a you know a thousand square foot home after living in a thirteen thousand square foot home to make myself happier. I did it because it felt like the right thing to do. It felt more reasonable. It felt like sort of zeroing out and 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 starting again from there, and. I got happier. I didn't invite community into my life because I wanted to get happier. It felt like the right thing to do. I lived behind gates and, you know, in that privileged lifestyle, and I thought that didn't really feel wonderful. Right. So it's each step into the, the good and the right, and you find happiness is the, 
is the result. All right, so. But it's a practice, man. You have to actually practice, because I could wake up every morning, and I could turn on the news, and I could get really depressed. But guess what I do? I pick up Rumi. I pick up a Rumi book, and it reminds me of what I think is really essential for me, for my heart. And so I walk out with, instead of junk food, I walk out with real food. And that buoys me through the day. Okay. And um, how about the planet? What do we need to do? Like, so we talked about the micro level. How about the macro level? Uh, how do we get to, you think, the... Because it's, like you said, you turn on the news, it's so dark, right? And, you know, my main issue in politics is getting mm -hmm. money out of politics because I think it corrupts everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can't win on climate change or any of those other things until we stop having our politicians funded by the groups who make money off of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but how, using the principles that you have learned, how do you get to the right result in, in globally? Uh, if you, if for me, if mm -hmm. you think globally, you get lost in a, in a, in a feeling of powerlessness. Mm -hmm. So I think truthfully about my own self and what it is that I can do to live, as Gandhi said, to be the message of a, of a, of a more uh, equitable, just world, even in terms of the environment, in terms of the resources I use. How do I do that in my life? And then how do I work in my community and in my conversations like this to reflect that out? So many, here's where I think we're stuck. So many people are screaming out here at that guy and saying, if you would just, and if you would just, instead of creating a more powerful story, right, we're against something rather than for something, and I think that that has an, eff an energy, again, sorry to use the word, uh, uh, but I think that has an energy that uh, is neutral. Like, we're pointing the finger out rather than heal. The only true revolution, I believe, is the personal revolution. So the simple answer to your question is, you be more reasonable in your resources. And, and then you reflect that out when you do your politics, your conversations. So many people in my business talk about this, and then we all, you know, we fly privately. Some may need to for safety reasons, I understand, but we don't reflect the lifestyle that we, that we think is a reasonable lifestyle in the world. Yeah, I'm afraid though, if we do an inner revolution that we're gonna get steamrolled. I think we need an outward revolution. And I don't mean violence and guns and back and you know, all the what crazy What is an people. outward revolution? I, I mean, we need to change the system here, uh, the political system here in America, so that people can have an opportunity to live the life that, right. that we've lived. Well, right? I think they're gonna go hand in hand, but I'll give you an example of a system that did change, and because people were not changed in their hearts, it was a very corrupt system, and that's uh, America. We had this, uh, this, this constitution that said all men are created equal, and then women were basically property, and, and of course slavery, they were property, because they hadn't healed and seen the brotherhood, right? And so we had a system that was revolutionary in the world, but it was still very corrupt. It became an empire, we did a lot of things that were uncool, on a personal level, on a racial level, and we're starting to get better and grow and heal that now. So, to me, a system's gonna become an outgrowth. I, I like working, I love that you guys are working at the systems level, because I think they both work at once. But without the undergirding, without people actually changing, you could change all the laws in the world. If people are still harboring that much anger, that much violence in their heart, it's gonna act out even in a perfect system. It's gonna act out. Yeah, I, I know you were talking about it in the movie in terms of the civil rights movement and how Martin Luther King was telling people to liberate their oppressors, right? And that's really deep. And, it's and, tough. And, and, and I'm not sure I'm there yet. <laughs> okay. I understand, I understand. Right? I, and it's challenging and, it's, and, 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 and it's, it's very honest and, and courageous of you to admit that because it is tough. Like, what's easier for you? If I say, here's a gun, there's some bad people coming, right? So here's a gun, you get to shoot them. Or you've got you've to walk with your body and love them and you may suffer. So you're against Django. You would have gone in a different direction. I haven't direction. seen it yet, my <laughs> okay. goodness. I haven't quite seen right, it. Believe me, me, he grabs a gun. He okay. grabs a gun. I think, I've, yes, I'm familiar with Tarantino. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Let, let me on, end on, a, on that fun note. Uh, do you still uh, go to Hollywood parties, or are you done with that? Uh, do you have any guilty pleasures? Uh, do I go to Hollywood parties? I've been recently to a couple of Hollywood parties, and I found out something very, very interesting, which is uh, they used to not interest me because I don't think I was as authentic or interesting. So I really don't care about grosses and what movies are making, it doesn't interest me. I like this conversation. So now that I've become more of this conversation, when I go to Hollywood parties, this conversation comes to me.
There so, you go. Uh, a little piece of zen <laughs> to just sort of spin the conversation. No, it's true. And I'll connect this to a, a conversation I just had recently with somebody sitting in that seat, Nina Hartley, who was a really legendary porn star, right? Mm, and mm. she says, you This know, seat? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. All right. So okay. now you know. That energy is still there. <laughs> wow, and you goodness. know what? You just got a little bit of her, her argons inside you. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'm and, not going to go to the next joke, but go ahead. <laughs> but but it, it's. You know, she talked about it in the terms of porn, but it's the same thing, which is that sometimes you put out what you want, right? And so there was this, we were talking about this guy who in his 60s decided, I'm gonna, I wanna have sex with young girls and put it on tape and get paid for it. Mm. And he's like, that's what I want. And he made it a reality. And so in your case, you've made this lifestyle a reality. And so it comes to you. So yeah. in his case, women come to him and money come to him, which to us seems amazing. Like if yeah. you tell the average yeah. guy, they'll pay you to have yeah. sex with 20 year olds and when you're 60, they say, no way. Yeah. But there's something amazing about being something. Why do I want his story now? No, I'm just I know, kidding. right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> like I no. know, that guy's my hero. But that's <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> All right, and, uh, and your, content, your old friends, et cetera. I mean, I don't know how much you hang out with Jim Carrey. You know, you, know, you made a lot of movies with him, et cetera. Do they accept this, or are they like, you know, now you're teaching at Pepperdine, are, yeah, they, yeah, now, yeah. are they calling you the nutty professor? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, um, you know, I just had dinner with Jim for the first time in a long time, and I can tell you that um, I have never had more love for that guy, and we're like brothers. So, look, man, we're all on journeys, you know? Like, I'm not sitting here saying, I'm right. Mm -hmm. Look at me, I've got the answers. I'm saying, I am experiencing something that is elevating and awesome. You wanna hear about it? And then if it applies to you, if it opens up any doors for you, fantastic. I think if I stood there and said, I'm right, the square footage that I've chosen is right, my lifestyle is the right lifestyle and you're wrong, I don't think my friends would really respond to that. That's interesting, I gotta work on that too. There's a lot of <laughs> okay. I'm right and you're wrong on the Young Turks, but okay. All right. Tom Shady, great conversation, you, really brother. appreciate Thanks, it. Man. Thanks for having right. me, Thank you. appreciate it.